Hey there, my name is Oshin Lunny and this is Audio Talks, the podcast formerly known as Audio Matters, a bi-weekly podcast on all things audio, presented to you by Harman. Every episode, we will endeavour to bring you some of the most interesting, insightful and innovative people from the world of great audio. This week's episode is called In Tune With The Senses, The Secrets Behind A Unique Sound DNA and is all about the fine art of sonic branding. And I am thrilled to be joined by two exceptional proponents of the art, Suzanne Chani and Marraine Rosamond. Suzanne is a five-time Grammy Award-nominated composer, electronic music pioneer and neoclassical recording artist who has released over 20 solo albums, including Seven Waves and The Velocity of Love. And her work has been featured in films, games and countless commercials. Suzanne has provided the voice and sounds for Bally's groundbreaking Xenon pinball machine, created Coca-Cola's pop and pour sound and carved out a niche as one of the most creatively successful female composers in the world. Moraine Rosamond is strategy director at Massive Music, one of the leading creative music agencies in the world. They help brands find their voice and tell their story through music. Welcome to the podcast, Suzanne and Moraine. I'd love to start with you, Suzanne. When did you first become aware of the relationship between brand identities and signature sounds? I was uh, deeply, deeply involved with the Buchla electronic music instrument, and I had gone from uh, Berkeley, California, where I worked with Buchla. I went to Los Angeles, where I tried to introduce the Buchla to the film community. And then I landed in New York because I was doing a solo Buchla concert. I very quickly became hungry and needed to make money. And I realized that advertising was the one outlet that really had an opening for me because the record labels were looking backwards. They wanted something they already had. And since I didn't play the guitar and I didn't sing, the advertising agencies didn't understand what I was doing, but that didn't bother them. They loved it. So I became this brush fire of fascination in advertising because I could create new sounds. And for me, that was a very instinctive thing to do. It opened up a whole new avenue in advertising. And uh, it was quite lucrative as I learned how to navigate the various uh, systems of royalties. What was the main difference between composing music for adverts and this new field of logo design? Well, one thing that comes to mind, I remember, um, I love the small form. You know, in those days, commercials were maybe a minute or half a minute, but a logo could be anywhere from a third of a second, as in the case of AT&T, to three to five seconds or 20 seconds for Columbia Pictures. And I love that microcosm of sound design. So one of the most fascinating jobs for me was the AT&T job, which was a third of a second. Technology was advancing every day. So when I arrived in New York, I had the Buchla. Don Buchla invented the first analog modular instrument. The technology was always evolving. Every day you'd wake up and there would be something new. And one of the instruments that came along was the synclavier. And it allowed me to go in and do microsurgery, really, on a sound. It was completely digital. And so all of this excited my bleeding edge fascination with technology to be able to do this. The AT&T sound was one third of a second. But for me, you know, as a composer, it had a beginning, a middle, and an end. You know, I loved compressing design. And that was the nature of logos, really, to express a composition in a very short period. It's a very fascinating field because people mistakenly think of uh, advertising music as some kind of lighthearted, simplistic, jingly thing, you know. But it's very deeply sophisticated because in order to have something that wears well, that will last through millions of hearings and repeated use for years, which is the nature of a logo. You have to embed in this complexity. You have to work on many layers so that it has T 
teeth. It has substance. It has something that allows it to endure. And it's hard to explain, but uh, you know, the people who do this well understand that. Fascinating. Fascinating. And um, what would you say motivates your work in this field of sonic branding? I grew up as a classical musician playing the piano. I got a master's degree in music composition, traditional. But then my life turned upside down when I met Don Buchla. So I worked at the artificial intelligence lab with the computers that were the size of a small railroad car in those days. So all of that fascination with being able to create a sound really from scratch, so it didn't exist in nature. It was something that you designed by definition when you're working in this electronic and digital media. I just took to that naturally. For me, it was pure poetry. You know, I never really understood what I was doing. It seemed so natural. The sound that you created could trigger emotions and feelings and ideas that were maybe perfectionistic. And you found that everything had the idea of a sound embedded in it. You spoke there about this very artistic concept of finding the idea of sounds embedded in objects and really bringing out the sonic identity of products and indeed brands. Uh, But of course, you also had a parallel creative life working on your own releases. How did you find a balance between your commercial work and your own very personal recording projects? I thought of myself as a recording artist from the beginning. But because I could not get a record deal, I realized I had to self-fund my own recordings and self-produce them. And those were very, very expensive. Technology was very expensive in those days. I mean, just that one instrument that I mentioned that I used in advertising was $200,000 in those days. 50 megabytes of RAM was $50,000. I mean, it was just a technology that was it was just off the charts so this was my passion and what i did was i worked as an artist in advertising during the week and then on weekends i did my recordings so they were they were truly symbiotic i had a, a kind of a principle that my music was not destined to be commercial you know it didn't have that focus So I wasn't trying to make something commercial. I was trying to make something personal. And so, uh, you know, I had the best of both worlds. I could do commercial music during the week and still work as an artist. That is a great way of balancing these two strands of your creative expressions. But it also sounds like you worked seven days a week for many years. Yes, I did. (laughs) Okay, now we're going to listen to some examples of both of your work, uh, starting with you, Suzanne. And the first one is really one of the most iconic Sonic logos ever designed. It is the Coca-Cola Pop and Pour. The Pop and Pour was really pivotal in my career in many ways, because um, Coca-Cola was, as you can imagine, one of the largest accounts in advertising. And I had been knocking on their door or on the agency's door for quite a while until it I kind of made it open. <laughs> so <laughs> I knew that my work in advertising was my, uh, you know, way to bootstrap my recording career. And so I was unabashedly uh, focused on money because I needed it. I needed it for my art. And uh, by that time, I had figured out some of the the way that royalties worked. And when Coca-Cola asked me to do a sound, well, they just presented me with a blank space and said, can you do something in there? And I said, yes. Of course, I always say yes. And... uh, I thought to myself, well, if I do a sound for this one commercial and it fits in this commercial, it might not fit in other ones. So I, from the beginning, focused on designing a sound that would work any place, which meant 
It didn't have a pitch center. It didn't have a particular melody. It was an abstraction. And I came up with the idea of the bubbles, which electronically were not difficult to produce, really, because you take a very low, uh, say, sawtooth waveform, and you put it into a bandpass filter, and you pick off the harmonics, and those become the bubbles. And then the white noise on the bukla, there's nothing to this day as good as the white noise on the bukla. And so, you know, doing the fizz was another natural thing to do. So anyway, this sound was uh, generic enough that they could use it in every commercial all over the world. And so that was, you know, ka Yeah. Wonderful. And now we're going to hear um, the Liberator Atari TV spot, which may appeal to fans of the Netflix series Game On. Well, that that was an example of a more you know complete uh, uh, commercial because it had a vocal and rhythm section, and you know what we did that was a specialty was the integration of electronics into more conventional uh, instruments. When I first came to New York and I was doing session work, I was always upset because they would ask me to do electronics, but there was no room for it and there was no way to integrate it. And that's why I started my own business so that I could do uh, commercials like this one where I was responsible for the whole thing. And so the electronics are perfectly integrated with the track. It's part of the rhythm track. And to do that in those days, you had to start with the electronics. You could not overdub a rhythm because there weren't any ways to interlock the various tracks in those days. And so this is an example of a track that was perfect for my company, Chani Musica, to to do the whole package, to do the rhythm track, the vocal, and all the wonderful effects that were so playful and just fun to do. You know, I really did have fun in all of this. Yes. Hashtag team fun. Thank you, Suzanne. That was absolutely fascinating. And really some superb examples of iconic pioneering sonic branding in there. That leads us right up to the very modern work of Massive Music, one of the best known agencies for sonic branding in the world. And we're actually going to dive into some examples from you and Massive Music, Marine. But before that, um, just talk to us a bit about how it all started. Yeah. Well, first of all, wow, for that story, Suzanne, I think you really, uh, yeah, leaded the way for our profession uh, 40 years. And if I hear your stories, I'm like, wow, we're actually full circle back to trying to capture that essence. And I think that's also what we try to do with Massive so much. You know, we, we started as uh, producing music for ads. And what we see now is that, you know, brands are evolving, brands are becoming uh, bigger. The world is also becoming uh, smaller in that sense. So brands need a central point of who they are. And sound is just being acknowledged as having that potential, having that role. And the way that you compose the the, the Coca-Cola sound design, the bubbles is, is I think till this day still relevant. Uh, that, yeah, that's exactly what we still try to do at Massive. So we really try to see, okay, what's the essence of a brand? And can we create something that will help with their content. So, you know, help with the recall, help with the awareness, make people uh, clear and sound only, preferably that it's brand A or B talking to them. Uh, and can we do it in a creative way? And what was the start of your life in Sonic Branding, Moraine? Well, with the, I worked for Philips. Uh, so actually I started as a brand consultant, but uh, five years ago, one of the first projects I did was also working on the Sonic identity for Philips, um, where we were asked to create a logo a sound logo, they had a sound logo, but it needed to fit the new identity, the new proposition moving into healthcare. So we wanted it to be more approachable, more human in a way, more friendly, uh, but still true to the heritage. And what we also saw is like, hey, Philips is such a big brand, we need to create something that 
not only helps on the advertising, but helps with the brand experience. Uh, so preferably something that could live in their products and you know all their touch points. What we then try to do is always come up with a bigger idea, a concept. And what we did for Philips is actually go back to their first product, their sort of uh, right of origin, uh, which is the light bulb. And we broke over 300 light bulbs <laughs> so far and recorded them in all various ways. And then we sampled them and uh, we created what is known as a contact instrument. So it's really a v virtual instrument of all the possible sounds that we could get of a light bulb. And, if, you know, from plucking the glass to playing uh, the, the, the shell with a cello bow uh, to, you know, rubbing them together, getting weird kind of textures and then kind of forcing ourselves, okay, whatever we compose from music to UI sounds, let's take this instrument uh, as the basis. And that worked out really nicely. Fascinating. And we're actually going to listen to that Philips Sonic logo right now. Now we're going to listen to a Sonic brand book that you put together with Philips called the User Interface or UI Medley. Ah. Huh? Why? Very cool, very human and very fun. Where did you find those sounds? From the top, what you hear is actually my voice. Um, and then how we translated that uh, small interaction into a UI sound. Because when we had the instrument, uh, we were asked, okay, we have the logo, we have the instrument, we can create music, but we also need sounds for all our devices. How do we do that? And I, I, we also, we, all, yeah, we said yes. And then we're like, whoa, but well, they have a lot of devices, you know, from a blender to a TV, to a radio, to a toothbrush. How, how do we tackle this? And then uh, we actually, I, I watched a lot of the uh, Disney movies, Wally -E, sound design, you know, also how they did it for Star Wars. And what I really liked about that is the, it came to the idea actually that if you want to sort of humanize the interaction you have with devices, there's a lot of um, emotional information in the inflection, the intonation. So we also like if you say, hey, or hey, hey. Phonetically, it could be the same, but it's the inflection of your voice that changes. So that way, actually, we said, okay, let's make, uh, as you can hear in the example, a bunch of uh, alerts like, huh, huh, and then just mimic that in the actual light bulb sounds. And the first one, like the, ah, <laughs> it was just like, oh, you didn't reach your daily step count, or maybe you didn't sleep as well as you probably promised yourself you would. And then, yeah, the, those sounds were actually... Yeah, they're, they're being implemented as we speak. And it's a, it's a really cool sort of this, this yeah, brand language uh, for a living light bulb. And coming back to what Suzanne was talking about a bit earlier, um, designing micro sounds as sonic logos. Talk to us about your project for GVB, who provide public transport in Amsterdam. In my daily work, um, you know, if you present big orchestral scores, that's how you get people like riled up and excited. Um, but for example, when we did the transportation of Amsterdam, uh, it was a one second sound. And <laughs> you've been busy for two, three, four weeks creating a one second sound. And, and it's, it's not only about how the sound actually is created, but also like the placement and, and I, it was for the ticket machine, we did it uh, to help people buy tickets and tourists. So, you know, it was language barrier. And could we create something that was synonymous to Amsterdam? And, and I remember it was it was uh, such a uh, interesting project. We tested it with a, a, a sort of touchscreen interface at the central station, lured people in with cookies and had them test in like a nose sound, a bit of sound and a lot of sound variants. And uh, at the end, yeah, we actually saw that um, we could really speed up the uh, flow of people buying tickets by just placing alerts, uh, notification or touch interface sounds at the right positioning. Um, but the presentation itself was a five-minute intro and then like, boop, boop, <laughs> uh, at the end. Um, but it was also very cool. Yeah. Just a quick last one. Though. So we actually went back to what's the most recognizable sound for Amsterdam, the metallic bell of a tram. So we took that sort of metallic sound as the basis for all the little UI sounds we created. Brilliant. Uh, it's really fascinating to hear the creative process behind these sounds that are going to be heard many millions of times. So um, let's have a listen. And we're going to play them twice because they are indeed microsounds. So first, we'll hear the sound of success. 
And now we're going to hear a sound called alert. Uh, And now for something a bit different. Talk to us a bit about your Instruments for Change project. Yeah, it's it's a bit, it's it's more of a left field project, but I really wanted it to highlight. And um, I really believe in the power of sound and music. And uh, I also like next to the advertising uh, work we do, uh, it's always good to pick out something that you really feel you want to improve the world with. And so we did music for people with dementia in Amsterdam two years ago. And last year, I actually met a, a friend of mine, Lucas, who started a organization called Sounds of Change. And they do beautiful work. They go to areas of conflict, um, Syria, Lebanon. And there's a lot of places uh, where a lot of bad things happening at this time. And he uses music therapy to work with especially the communities and kids to yeah really get them past emotional trauma uh you know amazing yeah group exercises on improvisation how to translate emotions in music and i wanted to support that so the idea uh, is to set up a little side uh, how do you say initiative called instruments for change where we recorded multiple musicians from syria uh, senegal uh, amongst others with their traditional instruments so the kanun which is like a sort of harp that you put on your lap and uh, it's beautiful has so many overtones Uh, it's very uh, poetic but also the oud the syrian guitar the ne the flute Uh, we did vocals from senegal from mam uh, the artist and then we uh, recorded them in our studio and created samples and instruments from them and they are actually available for purchase through instruments for change.nl and uh, all proceedings all profits go to the organization of Lucas Sounds of Change to help him in his mission uh, of music therapy in areas of conflicts. And it's really cool. We started last year and the first track, so we just put it out in the world, but the first tracks are starting to come back. And it's really cool because, uh, as you can see, I send a canoon sample. Um, but And the second sample is actually how a musician used that to make a sort of hip-hop beat uh, as a musical uh, background. Uh, but we also had EDM tracks. We've had uh, very spatial uh, ambient tracks. Uh, yeah, so it's it's really cool to see that take shape. Uh, that's fantastic. Okay, now we're going to actually hear that canoon sample from Instruments for Change. And then we're going to hear the hip hop beat that one of the musicians made from it. Love it. A great project for a great cause. Uh, Marine, from your perspective, why is sound so powerful in our lives and how do sonic logos fit into all of this? I've played music my entire life. It is the shortcut to emotion. I always love the quote, uh, if art's how we decorate space, music is how we decorate time. For me, that that is the uh, the beauty and that's the uniqueness. You can speak a language that is that is global and speaks to everyone and anything that has emotions. And I think what we're trying to see now as well is, you know, we react faster to it than visuals. We can say so much information. Uh, I think also with the rise of voice assistance, you know, a little UI sound here and there, a little sound logo can be so much more effective in, uh, yeah, sending that information across to the listener. Um yeah, and uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, music is unique. I think <laughs> that's also what it brings everyone here to Massive. It's it's the passion and love for music and uh, having an p- opportunity to do that uh, and be working with it every day is, is a blessing. And how do brands fit into this evolution of our sonic language? Brands are becoming these entities. So you also see a shift of it's no longer linear communication, it's building a relationship. It's good to know that what you're creating, you try to create with a soul and a purpose and you're proud because you created something beautiful. Has our relationship with audio and sonic branding evolved in 2020 during the pandemic? What we already saw is that, you know, how people listen is changed. Uh, With uh, Spotify, I think context is very important. So you pick your playlist, you pick your mood more than you maybe pick your artist or your CD. And I think for a lot of people, the COVID was also 
a period of, uh, yeah, pulling the brakes, uh, taking a breather. And, uh, you know, the, the sky was no longer filled with planes. And I think a lot of us didn't have the daily commute or the open floor work environment. And of course, it's a terrible situation. But I also hear a lot of people being more uh, zen, so to speak. What we also see, we're, we're zooming like crazy. You know, we're all wearing a lot more headphones than we used to. It's changing also the human interaction. I think the, the, the scientists actually said, you know, because we don't have that body language uh, in interaction, the Zoom fatigue is actually a, a, a real thing. Yeah, I really agree. I'm wearing these lightweight JBL headphones and you really notice the benefits after a day of Zoom meetings. It makes a big difference to how you feel the next day. Um, so as you mentioned, technology is evolving, people are Zooming away, and we also have a new relationship with audio thanks to music streaming services and new voice interfaces. What do you think the future holds? It's going to be very interesting because I think, you know, uh, it's it's developing at an accelerating rate. So what I what I see is that you know insurance brands have apps. Uh, I think toothpaste brands now go to Google Home. Uh, the weather is on your watch. Uh, I think what happens is you will create your own sort of system of brands that you prefer, and they all live in the digital space because of the the Internet of Things. Everything's connected. But I don't think that will necessarily create a rise for the desire of visual interfaces. People actually want to decrease their screen time. They want to have less uh, notifications, less alerts, less of their attention divided. So what I foresee actually is more you sort of define what brands you want to interact with. And then you want to do it in very short, routine, automated sounds and snippets and uh, actually trust that sort of ecosystem uh, of brands to just facilitate around you. So I'm also, um, I, I think that there's going to be a lot of routine and a lot of uh, sharing platforms. Suzanne, given the future looks like it's going to be more about audio interfaces, how do you see the balance of audio and visual elements when it comes to branding? I think that the the trick is to do that marriage you know, that that's something that's overlooked, uh, that when you do have a visual, the sound needs to seem as if it were generated by the visual. They need to be from the same, you know, source of life that they come from. That was something that I love to do is that seamless marriage of visual and sound. Suzanne, we just heard Moraine talking about the soothing aspect of audio, particularly during the pandemic. And a lot of your compositions are quite meditative. Was there a wellness aspect to the music you compose? That was the uh, aspect that originally got me into electronics. There was something about the electronics where you could just relax because you knew that you could count on the machine. So my first album, Seven Waves, is an expression of that, of that feeling of total comfort that you can get when you're immersed in this world of a safe place to be with the machine. I also think that in the pandemic, what's happened is that we've been stripped of our pretenses, that all these high-powered, you know, performance groups that we used to see that had all the accoutrements of lights and staging and, you know, production. And now people are sitting in their, you know, kitchens and living rooms kind of singing you know, on mic. And I think it's brought us back down to earth in some ways that's good. It's stripped away, as I say, the pretensions that were growing because they were, you know, Electronics gives us a lot of crutches and tools. You know, we have auto-tune, we have this, we have that. We have all these ways of, of uh, doctoring and Photoshopping our sound. And so now our ears are going to become, I think, more open to the human. I really liked what you said about going back to analog instruments. 
people want to incorporate the new technologies, but you want to create with your hands again. You want to be in the moment of creating. Yes. What I also find astonishing that if I work with some of the composers now, it could be you know like uh, eighteen years old, nineteen years old. They don't they don't play piano. They don't play guitar, but they play the Ableton Push. It's pushing the boundaries of how you compose music. And I think th that's really cool to see. Like we, we take the traditional knowledge and now we go back to those analog uh, instruments as well. Yeah, it's our root system. You know, we don't come from the air. We come from the depths of our human, you know, evolution culturally and artistically. You need to tap into the roots. So I know what you're saying about the young musicians. They don't know a an F sharp from an F. I mean, we need it all. It's a language. And what does this all mean for the world of sonic branding? The one thing that uh, also stuck by me is like, you, you actually almost want a brand to be a band. Just as you can hear if something is Radiohead and you can see the visual identity of Radiohead. I think that, you know, you're, you're very successful in sonic branding if you can create such a sound almost. It's cool to see where music production for brands and advertising is heading. Well, in my day, it was a no-no, you know, to have your your already defined and successful music be used as a brand by, you know, a company. And I think you're right about creating that identity. Any great band, you can tell on the first note or two who it is. And that kind of identity is uh, the band's identity. But I think you put your finger on the depth of identity that is contained in music, that one or two notes already speaks, triggers our understanding of something that we know. Suzanne, if you had to pick one sonic identity to rule them all, what would it be? For me, it's the waves. You know, it's the ocean waves. Amazing. Such a good answer. Thank you. Marine, what do you think might be coming next from the technology side of sonic branding? You know, what I would find really interesting is the, the self-generating music. Uh, you get a lot of uh, adaptive ads. And what if we could create these parameters? It's kind of making my own job redundant, but <laughs> it's uh, very cool to see if that would be possible. So you could create this self-composing algorithm for a identity. Hey, uh, an open question for you both. What would be your best advice for a brand looking to establish a distinctive sonic presence in 2020? Well, I think they should avoid an AI approach to <laughs> generating their music. <laughs> <laughs> because I know some big companies would like to do that to avoid paying any kind of royalties. <laughs> so I don't think that's, you know, that's been around forever. Um, when I was doing computers at Stanford, we had a program called the Banal Tune Generator, and it would, you know, generate, <laughs> generate music and all that. You know, we're fascinated because the machine can think and can parallel us in some way. And all that's fascinating, but I don't think it eliminates us by any means. Uh, and I hope it doesn't. I would say that's a no-no. Okay. I hope so too. <laughs> yeah. To build on that, I also like, if I were to give one advice to people, stand for something. Don't come with the, what we call briefing bingo. Like <laughs> we're human centric and we're transparent, we're open and we're all about the future and blah, blah, blah. Stand for something and you might have a few haters, but that's okay. You know, don't get too many stakeholders in the room. Create a small team and make something uh, that you feel proud of and might uh, rub against a few people in the wrong direction, but that's that's okay. And that's how you also how you make something memorable. So there you have it. Avoid AI music composition and avoid briefing bingo. That's some solid advice. Thank you. Suzanne, you had a really interesting project around a GE beep. Talk to us about that. They they came to me with a dishwasher. It was the first dishwasher that made a sound. It made a beep. And uh, they wanted me to do a score for this, you know, dishwasher. And so I recreated the beep and I orchestrated it into a language so that the, the dishwasher could really talk. <laughs> GE 
2500. It can do almost everything but talk. They came back to me and said, well, you know, truth in advertising, you're not allowed to manipulate this beep at all. And I said, well, if people listen to 30 seconds of this same beep, they will go crazy (laughs) (laughs) and it won't work. And so, you know, they, they allowed me to do this approach and it won every prize there was to win in advertising. It was huge. It was called the beep. And then we had cousin of beep and son of beep and, you know, nephew of beep. And you know, so it became a whole, you know, trend. It was kind of a, a moment in time in history of, you know, taking technology that was coming out in products and finding a voice for it in in the world of uh advertising. Uh, That's a brilliant story. I love it. I can see you there fighting your corner against some executives who could benefit from uh, some education, shall we say. (laughs) I mostly ignored them. (laughs) (laughs) You You get a great sense of your personality uh, through these stories. You really had to forge your own path and build this sonic branding industry. And at times, it, it, it sounds like it was against the immediate wishes of some clients who were perhaps less receptive to your pioneering compositions. Well, I'm sure Marin notices the same thing, that input from clients very often is counterproductive because it's so hard to talk about sound and you have to limit that interaction because it's confusing for us who are sound people and music people to interpret, you know, what, what they're trying to input In the beginning, maybe I tried to listen too much and I learned quickly not to, not to listen. And, um, when I built a studio, the clients were put in a glass booth where they could see the production, but they weren't allowed to talk except for very specific times. A soundproof booth for your client. I love it. (laughs) Clients under glass. Clients under glass. Very handy. I don't know if you run into that now. Well, yeah, I think what we also see is uh, we we had a, a running joke here as well. At a certain point, you're at version 12, diff mix three, uh, final VO cut four. And then, you know, and you're like, uh, <laughs> right. you know, I had you had something very fun at the beginning. And then uh, it, because it just went through the mill of um, <laughs> right. feedback uh, and after 20, 30 times, uh, you know, it's very difficult to then, because I think I, I love what you said in the beginning as well. Having fun is something uh, you can hear. I, at least I always feel like working with uh, composers, sound designers who had fun, I can hear it because you, you're smiling in the studio. And you, you, uh, sometimes you have that project that you kind of lose that after round 25 <laughs> and that's also something you want to avoid if you stand if you've created something and you think it works indeed i had to learn that myself as well stand for it stand for it right okay good words to live by and now it's time for the final question every episode we invite our legendary guests to add a track to the audio talks playlist on title so starting with yourself marine what is your nomination to join our tuneful time machine and why so I actually, I picked the song uh, from the band uh, Ill Considered. It's a UK uh, jazz, from, yeah, actually free music. And uh, it really helps me here. It's, uh, it has a lot of emotion. The bass sort of has this locked groove and the drummer and saxophone player just go mental on it. And uh, yeah, it really helps me focus, but also just, yeah, gets me excited. Great choice. Thank you, Maureen. And how about your good self, Suzanne? Well, I know you're not looking for the Goldberg variations played by Glenn Gould <laughs> because, you know, that's what I listen to. Uh, but I, I like Billie Eilish uh, a lot. And, uh, you know, she has a piece, I guess, called Ocean Ocean Eyes. And of course, the ocean is my domain. So, you know, that, that speaks to me. So maybe that's more in keeping with your um, list. Wonderful. I think we should add both of those. Tremendous choices. Okay. (laughs) My own addition to the playlist for this episode is Simple Dreams of Simple Days by Mike Slott, because he's a phenomenal producer who I think is really walking in the footsteps of the great analogue synth pioneers. And with that, 
it's time to say thank you so much, Suzanne and Moraine. That was such a fascinating conversation all about the fine art of sonic branding. It's been a glimpse into an incredible history and an incredible future. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was fabulous. Honoured to be here, guys. Listeners, don't forget to check out the show notes for a link to the wonderful documentary A Life in Waves, all about the art of Suzanne Chiani and also to Marlene's Instruments for Change project and, of course, the Audio Talks Series 2 Tidal playlist. We will be back in two weeks to chat about good sound and fascinating cars with one of the world's most loved DJs who is also a racing team owner and an accomplished racing driver. Oh yes, oh yes, I am of course talking about the one and only Carl Cox. In the meantime, do feel free to subscribe and tell all your friends about the Audio Talks podcast presented to you by Harman. We're actually going to sign off now with JBL's very own Sonic Brand. And we'll see you next time.